Hi, Anson Garcia here with Verizon, and as a technologist for the last 20 years, falling into the realm of UC early on in my career, I understood a little bit about 911, E911, what PSAPs were, and the role Annie and Allie played to deliver an address to the endpoint, the PSAP. However, I knew very little what was happening in the middle. What technologies were used in the middle, from the customer to the piece app. I knew those two pieces, but again, didn't know that middle piece. So I did a little investigation and hope this helps you out as well as it helped me out. Join me in this video and let's peel back the onion and see exactly what's going on in the middle. My hope with this video is you're going to be able to understand a little bit about 911 as it relates to URL ELINs using a local LEC or an ILEC, a CLEC, uh, ERL ELINs using ERSs like Entrado and Red Sky, URL ELIN using ERSs with dynamic location servers. Now we're talking about something like Cisco Emergency Responder. We're going to look at Pitaflow and using ERSs with Microsoft Teams, Calling Plan, and Direct Routing. We're going to look at Pitaflow using ERSs with WebEx calling, now the new WebEx calling plan, and also SIP trunking with a provider using WebEx calling. And we'll look at Pitaflow using an ECS, that's an ERS basically, they call it a little bit different, with mobile phone carrier like Verizon. And we'll take a look at one product called Rapid SOS and see what that's all about. What are they doing in the wireless space as far as 911. Okay, first let's look at some definitions and make sure that when I say something that you're thinking the same thing. So E911 right here allows the PSAP to display calling party number and an address, right? You want that call taker to be able to know where you're at just in case you can't give your address. All right, we're gonna look at Annie. When I say Annie, I mean caller ID. Okay, it's a little more technical than that, but I will use those words interchangeably. BTN, this is a bill-to number, and it's basically a DID associated with a service address when you order a PRI circuit or a SIP trunk or something like that. And the bill-to address or the bill-to number is basically the default 911 route entry in a LEC Alley database. I'll explain more about that later. Alley, this is the database that will correlate a physical address to a telephone number. PS Alley is just like the Alley database, except now the customer's PBX. Telephone system is going to provide a caller ID, or the ANI, right? And the LEC, the provider, the DID provider is going to allow that ANI, or trust that ANI coming in. And then go look up the Alley for that Annie. Okay, MSAG is the Master Street Address Guide. Nothing more than a master guide of all the valid addresses. Now, sometimes the MSAG is regional, sometimes it's national in the case of an Entrado or Red Sky, things like that. All right, so when you enter an address in your Alley database, you're gonna want to it needs to check, you know, you can't put in 123 Main Street, nowhere, Texas. It wants to make sure that that's a valid address so they can route a 911 call to that particular PSAP servicing that address. Select a router, nothing more than a piece of hardware, a piece of software that has several PSAPs connected to it. And it's going to route either through PRI, analog, or SIP trunk, the call over to the PSAP. And in CAMA, Centralized Automated Messaging Accounting, fancy term, it's an analog circuit that can transmit, or a digital circuit that can transmit caller ID, any, all right, in some form or fashion, either through tones, if it's analog, uh, D-channel and PRI. So PSAP, the Public Service Answering Point, this is a publicly funded facility where 911 calls are routed for dispatch, okay? This is where the PSAP agents the telecommunicators, the call takers, the dispatchers. This is where they live at. This is where it's at. Now, these are different. Uh, usually, the county is in charge of these, and any municipalities or cities inside that county kind of roll up. But that doesn't have to be so. There's not any mandate. Sometimes cities 
say, you know, we're going to do our own thing. We're, gonna, we're not going to rely on the county. We're going to build our own PSAP. So there's no set standard on who actually runs the PSAP or anything like that. And, okay, uh, these next couple are kind of inside, have to do with PSAP. The CAD system, just an, uh, a system that kind of correlates all the data for the dispatcher, the call takers and dispatchers. For example, sometimes Annie comes into the PSAP and Allie comes into the, the PSAP and they have mapping systems and things like that to put you know, a GPS uh, pointer on a map to see where this guy or this gal is calling 911 from. So it's kind of a, a, a interface, a system to take these systems information in, display it on the screen, and then also some dispatch which we'll see later facilities and features inside that system as well. Uh, the telecommunicator, that's what I uh, referred to a second ago as the, uh, the PSAP agent. So these are very highly trained, skilled call takers and dispatchers that work in the PSAPs. GIS, these are graphic information systems. When you have information like addresses and GPS, things coming in to the PSAP, the graphic information systems are the things that kind of put things on a map. So there's not like a Google map thing or anything like that. These are highly specialized applications. They're going to put, you know, officers on a map. They're going to put the people that are calling on a map. They're going to put the address, the 911. So there's a lot of information on these GIS systems. Nina, it's the entity or the agency or the nonprofit organization that provides framework for legislation to federal and state government to implement and improve location accuracy of emergency calls. That's a mouthful. These are the guys that help states write their 911 legislation. We know that about 15 to 18 states today have legislation around 911. Well, these guys are you know conduct workshops and help them write templates or write templates so they can take that and turn that into legislation so their state congresses can pass or recently right the ray bonds act and uh carrie's law that we all know about it's probably why you're here trying to learn a little bit more about this but they also help the government the fcc write legislation around so that's a group of experts 911 experts and they're trying to really normalize and provide framework around all the PSAPs. PSAPs all over the nation are kind of all on their own. They're doing their own thing. Uh, lots of technologies out there trying to sell into uh, the PSAPs. So what, what Nina's trying to do is kind of, you know, let me provide some framework. Let me provide some common denominators so we can build something where all the PSAPs can work better together. Right now, they're kind of like islands, and they've been that way for 40, 50 years. Pitaflow, this is a new technology. I say new, it was developed in like 2011, but uh, new in the realm of 911. Uh, provides a flexible and versatile means to represent location information in a SIP header using XML schema. Okay, this will eventually retire Alley and PS Alley and things like that. You're going to see if that doesn't make sense for you guys, you're going to see how this works here in a second. So, Pitaflow is kind of the upgrade to uh, Annie Alley, PS Alley. So, first one here MLTS, the multi line telephone system, Cisco Unified Communication Manager, Skype for Business on prem server, Skype for Business online with calling, Microsoft Teams with calling plan or direct routing and via PBX, uh, Cisco WebEx calling. It's nothing more than just a general term talking about a digital PBX, whether it be in the cloud, on-prem, whatever. So ERS, this is the emergency routing service. This provides organizations with 911 call routing to all PSAPs, okay? There's like 5,000 plus PSAPs around the nation and they're, connected to their local carrier, their LEC or ILEC. So these guys, Red Sky, Entrado, Bandwidth.com, these are kind of guys that are ERSs. They kind of developed and said, hey, you know, well, let's start a company and let's connect to all the PSAPs out there. And that way people can connect to us if they're doing centralized trunking. 
ECRC, these are call agents inside the ERS. If a call comes in and they can't route it to a PSAP, there's going to be a call agent that picks up the phone and says, hello, what's your emergency? What's your app? Not what's your emergency. They want to know your address because they want to route it to the right PSAP. They're not going to, they're not dispatchers or anything like that. They just, their systems had trouble routing into the right PSAP. They need to take that call and as quickly as possible, get your location. Hopefully you can give that and then uh, route you to the right PSAP around your jurisdiction uh, or your area. VPC, this is the VoIP Positioning Center. All right, this is an element, maybe one piece of software, maybe one piece of hardware, maybe several pieces of hardware, but it's just one element. It's going to rep be represented in my drawings as one element, and it's going to find out. It's in the ERS, and it's the thing responsible for finding out where to route the call to, all right, what PSAP the ERS needs to route the call to. So why all this craziness? I'm going to go through a lot of complex flows as far as voice calls, uh, 911 voice calls, and how we actually get that address to the PSAP. You're going to probably say to yourself during one of the slides, this seems pretty silly. It's crazy. I could come up with much better ideas here on how to get an address to the PSAP much more efficiently. Well, there's a reason for that, or there's several reasons, but one of the main reasons is there's not a lot of standards. The standards in 911 are very loose as far as the PSAPs are concerned. A lot of them are running different software. Many PSAPs are still using old technology. In fact, I've heard that a lot of them still have analog trunks into their facilities. So how are you going to, with technology today, and we have GPSs and we have uh, accelerometers on our smartphones and things like that. How are we going to get this information in when we, the, the connection that we have at the last mile to the PSAP is an analog connection. So anyway, a lot of these guys, and that's what Nina's doing. Nina's trying to normalize and formalize some framework so that PSAPs can get on all IP and do VoIP and data all on one network. So that's coming. That's a few years away as you'll see in a minute. But yeah, there's lots of old stuff out there. Counties are mostly responsible for the PSAP, but it's all over the map. Some couple cities get together and they want to do a PSAP. Two counties get together, maybe a county does a PSAP, but there's three cities in the county, but only one city wants to use the county because the other two want to build their own. Uh, they have better ideas or they have better IT guys that think that they can do it better. So there's not a lot, a lot of good framework and direction. And that's why we see all this stuff. Uh, you'll hear me might talk about the, the Nina and the new EziNet. And I'll try to explain that a little bit later as well. So these next couple of slides are kind of what we've had yesterday. And I say yesterday, uh, there's some, some of this still out there today. But I'm going to try to take you through yesterday, you know, what we're doing today. And then what is tomorrow going to bring as far as you know, 30,000 foot view of what uh, the customer and how they're going to get to the PSAP. So here we have yesterday and what we have over here, we have company A headquarters and he, they exist in town A. So maybe they have a building over here. They're going to connect to the LEC maybe with a PRI or uh, something like that. All right. Uh, that LEC is going to have a selective router. We're going to have one or more PSAPs connected to it based on how many PSAPs there are in the jurisdiction. Um, and yeah, it's going to have an analog maybe to the PSAP. All right. Here's company A, same company, but they have a branch over in another city, town B, and they have a PRI to the local LEC. So they're not doing centralized trunking, obviously. And then this LEC has a selective router and they have a couple of PSAPs hanging off there. So yeah, that's kind of your 30,000 foot view. It's easy, simple, and basically every town or even in the same towns if you have live in a big city you might need this because it's a different LEC or ILEC that's going to be providing you DID services and they're going to be connected to different PSAPs than the guy the LEC across town or something like that. What is going on today? Well here we have a service provider over here and here we have a customer. All right and then we have this thing called an ERS. We're talking Intrado we're talking Red Sky. We're talking guys like that. What they're trying to build, they said, hey, well, let's build this cloud over here. 
will connect up to the 5,000 plus PSAPs that are out there, right? A lot of PSAPs out there, 5,000 something. And then what we'll do is customers who want to do centralized trunking, uh, maybe they got a, a, a trunk from Verizon or AT&T or something like that. And then they can just do one from their SBC. They can connect it to the ERS and the ERS will then be responsible for routing the 911 call to the right PSAP. So maybe this customer has some phones in Houston and someone dials 911, you know, all 911 calls are going to go down this trunk, get to the ERS, and he's going to pick the right selective router to get to the right PSAP in Houston. Maybe they also have people in uh, San Francisco and someone dials 911 there. It's going to go down the same SIP trunk to the ERS and the ERS is going to figure out, oh, it needs to go over here. Maybe this PSAP is in San Francisco. Okay, what are we looking at for tomorrow? For tomorrow, um, what Nina's trying to do is get everybody on this next gen. You'll hear next gen 911. You'll hear EziNet stage 0, 1, 2, and 3, or I3. And what they're trying to do is build a big, let's just call it a big cloud with a bunch of technology in it. And they're all connected to the PSAPs via SIP trunking over here, data connections, basically. And then they're going to be connected to the service provider. And basically they'll say, hey, anyone that wants to connect up or route calls to any of the 5,000 plus PSAPs around the nation, uh, just connect up to me. All right. So that may sound strange because I kind of explained that same thing right here. All right. But this is a private company, ERS. Um, ERS is our, our, our uh, when I say ERS, it's, it's talking about Entrado Red Sky, private company. And then over here, this is going to be, you know, kind of the, a government run agency that's going to do the next gen 911. Of course, there's going to be some private entities here. Also, the people that are going to run software, and maybe they're going to have a PBX in here, a VoIP PBX, and it's going to service, you know, so all these PSAPs out here don't need to have their own key systems or Cisco call managers or, or things like that. And they can just subscribe to the service that's plugged into here. Maybe there's going to be call recording. These PSAPs do a lot of call recording, and most of them have call recording on site or custom made applications that plug into their CAD systems. Maybe there'll be a call recording entity up in uh, the next gen, uh, next gen 911, the EziNet up here, and they can just buy services. And it's gonna be very common for them to interface with this recording system up here. So that's kind of what we wanna get to. And then anyone who wants 911 services in the US is just gonna plug in to this uh, EziNet, this next gen 911 network. This is a long ways away. Uh, it needs a lot of funding over here. We need a lot of upgrades. Remember, we got we got uh, a lagging technology over here in these areas, or a lot of these PSAPs, not all of them. But uh, so this is years away before we can flip the switch and actually be in, into this. Okay, let's get into our meat of this talk. We're gonna look into emergency calling using a local LEC, and we're using SP Alley. SP Alley is Service Provider Alley. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. Let's see what we have to do. All my slides are gonna be the same. So we're gonna have like a customer on this side. We're gonna have some cloud stuff in the mi middle. This is that middle stuff I was talking about in the intro. We're gonna find out what goes on inside here. And then we're gonna have the PSAP over here and the PSAP agent, the telecommuter, and we're gonna have a PC, right? Cause we're gonna to need to pop up some information there. So let's go through what happens here. Customer is going to order service from the local LEC and they're going to get this bill to number. They're going to get an extra DID. Say he orders 100 uh, DIDs and one of those is going to be the bill to number and a service address. So when they order the service, the LEC is going to ask them, what is your bill to, uh, what is your service address? You know, what's the service address of this circuit that goes to your voice trunk? And then they're going to give him a bill to number. That's just a DID. That's a phone number. Just a real quick refresher here. This is a call manager here. This is your call controller. And this is a voice gateway. This is going to be a PRI or something like this. This is the LEC right here, right? And then we have some trunks going to the local PSAP over here. Could be more PSAPs. All right. So next, hey, Jack's calling 911. What's going to happen here? Well, that call controller is going to send that to the voice gateway. You can see the caller ID hasn't changed. It's the same. 
we're going to go over to the voice gateway we're going to make it into the lack go across to pri there and then look what happened here the pri or the uh, annie number has changed see here's the annie number here now it's changed to one two three one two three four which is our bill two number so that call id has changed it's going to go over to this selective router the selective router is going to look in the database based on this call id where do i need what piece app do i need to send it to it figures that out it's going to send it out a trunk right there it's going to get to the local piece app that local piece app cpe equipment key system call manager whatever is going to send that call right to the piece app agent then there's going to be some systems there that are going to scrape the annie they're going to know that annie that call id that came in and they're going to ask the local alley database hey i need the information i need the alley i need the address so i can pop it up on the screen so the telecommunicator the piece app agent knows where the address is to send dispatch to again Many people won't know where they're at, or it may be a child calling 911 or something like that. They're, they need that information. There it is. It's going to pop up because it found it in the database. Okay, the next couple of slides, we're going to be going through URL and ELANs. And I just want to give a refresher on what URL and ELANs do. So typically, you would have a customer do a 911 design. And what the customer would do is punch out something like this, okay? He'd get with his network guy. Looks like he has a great network guy. The network guy has created subnets for every floor. In other words, every PC or phone on a particular subnet is going to get a DHCP address within that subnet. So it's not always the case that subnets are like this, but we're going with this for this example. Now, all he needs to do is create a little spreadsheet over here. And you can see this subnet here, 1.0. He's giving ERL1, Emerger Response Location 1, or he's just calling it 1. He's giving him an ELIN, right? And there's an address and a floor. Okay, you can see here's my ELIN. There's my ELIN for floor 2. Uh, or my ERL and ELIN and ERL and ELIN and I'm gonna go over the the fourth one here in a, a moment. So what does this do for us? The goal is to accommodate multiple phones within an ERL, within an emergency response location, and represent all those phones with one or more ELINs. If a phone uh, that is in this ERL right here. We're going to represent a phone here. If it calls out to the PSDN, when it gets to the PSDN or part of the systems that are controlling this, maybe Unified Call Manager, uh, Skype for Business, whatever call control you have on-prem, what it's going to do is going to change the call ID. It's going to change the Annie number into the ELIN. Right? In other words, if this guy called 911, when it would go out to the PSDN, the call ID would actually change to this number. Now, the reason we do that is because when this customer ordered service, they ordered what they call PS Alley. And he's got this guy over here, which he put into, they gave him a portal, and he logged into the, the, the provider's portal, and he basically took his spreadsheet Put in the same information minus of course the subnets because telcos don't care about subnets but so he's got this information over here so when this call comes into the psdn with this particular call id that the psap or before we route it to the psap or when we route it to the psap there's going to be an alley database and it's going to look exactly like this and what's going to happen, it's going to look up that number that came in, and it's going to know the address, and in this case, the floor as well. That's the way things work. If someone else calls, you know, maybe it's the next day or a few days later, and there's another caller, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to go over to the PSAP or go over to the LEC, and before it gets to the PSAP, or excuse me, the call controller, whatever we're using on-prem, is going to change the number 
the call ID number to this number right here. Okay? That's going to happen every time. All right? And that's how we marry. We can use one number to represent all the phones in an emergency response location. We can use one ELIN to represent multiple phones in an emergency response location. So that's why uh, we, we do things like this. So we can accommodate movement, all right? That's when it starts making sense. If this same phone moved to this floor, somebody got promoted and they took their phone with them and moved it to that floor, and then they called 911 from this floor, well, when it goes out, they call control that we have on-prem or hosted or whatever, when it gets out to the PSAP, I'm going to call, you know, I'm going to do the like over here, you know, and then PSAP over here. It's going to take this number right here. That's going to be the call ID. And they're going to look in their database that they have, the customer updated. And they're going to know that it's 123 Elm Street, Austin, Texas, floor number two. All right. And that goes the same for any other phones that exist in here. So that's what ELINs and ERLs are all about. Hopefully that's understandable. And why do I have multiple ELINs over here? Well, you would typically always have multiple ELINs per ERL because there might be two people that call 911 at the same time. And you don't want to use the same ELIN every time. Let me give you an example of that. I'm going to kind of bypass some stuff here, but this guy is going to go to the PSAP over here and he's going to grab this number. We we have that here so they know they're floor four. This guy is also going to call 911. He's going to grab maybe this ELIN right here. They're both ERL4, you see there. And um, let's say what happens is this guy gets off the phone. There's always got to be a call back. So that's kind of mandatory. They have to call the user back. The PSAP, maybe the guy gets disconnected or something like that. And the PSAP out here needs to call back. Well, what number do they have? They have one of these two numbers, right? And depend on which one they call back, when it gets to the call system that's uh, on prem over here, the call system is going to know, oh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, five was John just called 911 and I changed the call ID number to this number here. So obviously, this incoming call is trying to call John, not Susie. Okay, so that's kind of why we do multiple ELINs per ERL. And that's a decision that's going to be made by the customer or the consultant or the partner that's working with that customer, uh, the E911 design. So hopefully that's understandable. And now we can go into the rest of, of the talk about ELINs and ERLs on the next couple of slides. Now, one more good example of why a customer would use ERLs and ELINs in their 911 design is what if they had a bunch of phones over here, call agents, let's say, but those call agents didn't have DID numbers. Maybe they were just internal numbers, 100, 101, 102. When they called 911, they would also get that call ID. Okay, and that would get out to the PSAP eventually, and then they're going to look up in their database, and they're going to grab, they're going to know where they're at. So that's another reason why people use ELINs and ERLs in their design, because many of them don't have DIDs. They want to buy less DIDs. They, don't, they have 100 call agents or something like that. They're not going to be, uh, buy DIDs for each of them. They just want outbound calls for those, but they still need to accommodate for 911 emergency calling. Okay, let's get to emergency calling with Earl Elin using a local LEC, but now we're using PS Sally. All right, what's the use case here? Customer has several buildings. Now he's got two buildings over here. There is no federal requirements here, so I'm still talking kind of old school stuff. And what does the customer need to do? Well, they need to purchase 
trunking from their local LEC provider, but what they're going to purchase in addition to trunking, they're going to say, I need PS Alley services. All right, so they're going to order PS Alley services. And they're also going to order ELINs, more numbers, for the ERLs, for their E911 design. So let's see what happens here. Okay, the customer is going to, he's got his little spreadsheet, right? He's got a wire map. Some people call this a wire map, but it's basically a spreadsheet. He's punching out his ERLs, ELINs, and addresses. And look at this, he's putting a subnet there, all right? Just like we saw on that kind of a summary page, kind of explaining ERLs and ELINs and how the design works. And what are we going to do next? Well, he's going to have to log into the local any database over here at his local PSAP. Now, these things are sometimes centralized or regional. Sometimes they exist in the PSAP. Regardless of that, you're going to see I put them kind of in the PSAP because that's where it makes sense to me where they belong. But he's going to get a login. He's going to log in over the web and he's going to punch out. He's going to basically take his spreadsheet and he can import it in here and he can just punch it out here. He doesn't have, he's got two entries. So he's going to just uh, punch it out manually and he's going to put the ELIN and address. ELIN and address. You can see 1234 and 1235. Elm Street, Oak Street. We got a Elm Street and we have a Oak Street. Both Magnolia, Texas there. Once we're done with that, we're going to do one more thing before we do that because I want to Let's, let's get Jack back here. He's not dialing 911 yet, but I just want to tell you when you do ELINs and ERLs and things like this, you have to have a call system. And most call systems like Skype for Business uh, Server on Prem, Cisco Communication Manager, they inherently have ability to take a call in based on subnet that they registered from and replace the call ID with the ELIN. You'll see why in a second. But so in call manager, this is uh, emergency calling, UCM emergency call, native emergency calling, something like that. And then you can do the same thing in Skype for Business Server. I'm just mentioning those two because they're kind of the most prevailing uh, on-prem systems today. And this also exists for hosted versions, Skype for Business Online. Of course, we know that's going away, but any Cisco, you know, Cisco UCM as part of uh, HCS or UCAS, offerings from uh, providers that actually host uh, CUCM in the cloud. So this feature exists. Some of you smart guys might think, hey, this guy needs a CER over here. Is he going to do stuff like that? No, we don't need a, a CER. We will discuss that later. Okay, Jack's going to dial 911. It's going to hit the call manager. Hey, we got some configuration in here that we told the call server. Hey, if you see a phone that is in this network, Go ahead and replace the call ID if he dials 911. So that's exactly what it did. The call ID is different, you see? Now it's coming out here. It's going to go to the local LEC. It's going to go across the LEC router. It's going to look up in the route database what PSAP do I need to send this to based on the call ID, right? And then we're going to go out to the local PSAP and it's going to hit the CPE equipment there. It's going to go on the PSAP agent's telephone system he's going to answer it with his headset or her headset and then the CAD system is going to ask the piece uh, the piece out alley database there hey I have this uh, this phone number just came in someone's taking a call I need to pop up on the screen some information especially I need to pop up the address so he's going to find it in that in this database right here and bingo it's going to pop up and now this guy or gal has in front of him the address, the address of the calling party of Jack over here. Now you might think something strange. What if this guy's choking or the call gets disconnected? How is he going to, the only number he has is this number. So if he calls that number, what's going to happen? We know that that's an ELIN. It doesn't exist really on any phone. Well, we can do some magic over here. If this guy does dial this number because they get disconnected, it's going to go around you know, it's going to go, they have trunks, separate trunks over here. They're going to be connected to the local provider. And it's going to go over here. And that number is going to route, it's going to route this way. And when it gets to this call server right here, that call server is smart enough to know someone dialed 911. It was this number right here, dialed 911. And that number that just came in, I swapped it. And so obviously they're trying to get a hold of this guy here. Let me go ahead and ring this phone and connect 
that callback to Jack here. Now there's timers and things like that. How long do you want to keep this cache for this ELIN that's going to translate over to Jack's number? Things like that you can read about. Again, in this system, I'm talking about a call manager here. So that's a native emergency calling in UCM. Okay, now let's look at emergency calling with Earl Elin using ERS and PS Alley static. Okay, this is the difference here. We're using an ERS. Let me take you through the drawing here. We still have a customer over here, but guess what? This customer now has a building in Dallas. So we have another building and it's outside of our area. Looks like we're doing SIP trunking now. All right. Now we're going to need an ERS. We're going to need an Intrado or Red Sky to provide ERS services because there's going to be PSAPs in Magnolia, Texas. Might even be in Houston. Magnolia is a little suburb out of Houston. Uh, and we're going to have in Dallas, Texas, we're going to have PSAPs that we need to route calls to there because we're only doing centralized trunking with our SIP provider. Hopefully that's Verizon. The use case, again, customer is using SIP trunking provider. Customer has several locations in different cities and wants to keep their centralized trunking. They don't want to buy trunks in Dallas and also trunks in Magnolia. They require E911 services. The customer is going to purchase DIDs from the SIP provider and they're going to purchase ELINs for however many ERLs they've come up with. So let's take a look at what's going to happen here. The customer is going to create a spreadsheet again. He's got his 911 design. He's got one ERL there. He's got an ELIN associated with that. There's the address and he's got a subnet there. So we're doing that again. And we got a four over here. You can see our subnets 1.0, 2.0. You can see there's 1.0, there's 2.0 over here and there's 3.0 over there. All right, you can see the addresses are corresponding. Here's 123 Oak Street, Dallas, Texas. There's the ELIN that he's going to provide for Dallas, Texas. And then there's the subnet. Okay, we're going to program this information also. We're going to get a login, not to our local PSAP regional uh, database. We're not going to update this guy anymore. We're actually using Entrado or Red Sky, and you're going to update their what they call Dynamic Alley database. All right, so he's going to get a login when he buys service from ERS, this ERS and he's going to log in and he's going to go ahead and start populating this information over here in ERS and look what he's doing here. He's putting in his ELINs and he's putting in his address and he's putting in a floor. Okay, what's next? He's going to configure his UCM over here because it has native emergency calling and he needs to put in here, hey, if you see a phone that's on this subnet, when it dials 911, Replace the call ID with that ELIN. Okay, that's all we're doing there. All right, so on and so forth. Okay, here's Jack. He dials 911. You can see his IP address is 1.0 there. So as soon as that guy gets it, he's going to look up in this guy. He's going to say, oh, 1.0. I need to change that call ID to this ELIN number. You can see it's changed right there before it goes to the SBC. It goes to the SBC, then it gets out to the ERS. It's not going to go to the local provider. Not down that SIP trunk. It's going to go down this SIP trunk to the ERS. It's going to get to the ERS. The ERS is going to ask the VPC. Remember, we went through those in the definitions, the Voice Positioning Center. This system is going to then ask the Dynamic Alley database, I need the address for this particular call because I need to send it to the PSAP. Okay, I'm going to go back just a second. I want you to see what happens to this database over here. Okay, here comes a VPC query to the Dynamic. You see that? We're extending that record, all right? We're on the fly extending the record. Okay, why would we be extending this record? You're going to find that out in a minute why we need to do that. But there's this thing called the SQ key, the Emergency Services Query Key. Okay, let me digress for just a second. I'm going to stop and tell you exactly what the SQ key is. Every ERS gets a bank of numbers, a, a bank of numbers. And just to simplify it, um, I'm going to say uh, Entrado gets the bank of numbers that start with 1, 2, 3. The keys that start with 1, 2, 3. Red Sky gets the bank of numbers that start with 1, 2, 4. Okay, let's just leave it at that. That's not exactly what happens, but there's different numbers, but you'll get the idea. Remember over here that 
each PSAP is connected to other ERSs. All right, there's Intrado, there's Red Sky, there's Bandwidth.com. There's a lot of guys out there providing this service. Okay, keep that in mind and we're going to continue on. Okay, now we're, the VPC is going to ask the selective router database where do I, what of these 5,000 uh, PSAPs, where do I route it to? What selective router do I send this call to? based on the information he has right now is just this information he has that DID so he figures that out he's going to send it over to the selective router that's going to go over to the PSAP and look what goes along with it this SQ key don't let that fool you uh, it, it confused me at one time is that a token what kind of key is that some, some security going on there no it's just a 10 digit number it's this number right here that that got transferred over here and it's the call ID okay it's basically came in as a call ID so this SQK key is a call ID remember that these systems a lot of these systems are connected via analog or PRI so the only thing they can transmit is call ID all right so we have to design or these people that are designing these things they got to design for the lowest common denominator the lowest common denominator is an analog trunk that sends tones for call id so the only thing we can send is, is call id it'd be nice if we could send uh, this address over there but we can't we, we have to send a call id and we know that this regional alley database doesn't have he didn't log in there and configure this stuff he configured it in the dynamic alley database of the ers okay keep that in mind What's going to happen now, that call is going to go to the telecommunicator, the PSAP agent, call taker. What's going to happen now is the CAD system here, the equipment here, is going to scrape that ANI, which is that key, which is this guy, and is going to send it to the regional database because all he knows about is I need to grab an alley, I need to grab the location, and, and I, I need to grab it from my regional alley database or the database that's in that PSAP. He doesn't have it, as I said before. But... He notices that 123 belongs to Intrado and they've got some functionality in this regional database that can go ask. There's a data connection that goes across the internet and goes to Intrado. Okay, also goes to bandwidth.com, also goes to Red Sky. But based on this number, this key, the first three digits there, he knows, oh, that's Intrado. Let me go ask them before I send. Uh, the CAD system back the address. So here it comes. He's going to ask him. He's, hey, VPC, I need some information based on this key right here. Well, that VPC is going to go ask the Dynamic Alley database. He's going to have this key attached to that record. Let's call it a pointer. And he's going to respond with this information, this DID and that address. That's how the magic happens, and we're going to send that back to the regional database, and then that's going to go to the CAD system, and voila. There's the 123 Elm Street, Magnolia, Texas, floor one, and the Annie is 123, 123, 1234. Now we finally have the right address there. Complex, I know, kind of weird stuff going on, but that's how it works. And if you want to do callback, it works just as before. If for some reason they get disconnected, this guy's going to call that any number. It's going to go across to the PSTN. They have PSTN connectivity up here, you know, and we're going to go eventually get to the SIP provider. That's going to, that call is going to come into the SBC. It's going to get to the call controller here. And then that call controller is going to say, oh, Jack just called 911 and I replaced his call ID with that number. And you're trying to get a hold of that number. Obviously, you're trying to call Jack back. So let me go and send you to Jack's phone and ring his phone. Okay, now let's look at emergency calling using Earl Elin, but we're using the ERS in dynamic mode here. All it means is now we're going to use a little more sophistication as far as our emergency feature set. All right, and that's at CER right here or Red Skies 911 Manager or Intrados Enterprise Gateway. Let's take a look at our use case first. This customer wants centralized trunking. 
needs to adhere to new federal and state laws, like Kerry's Law, like the Ray Bonds Act. He needs to support real-time movement of users now. So I didn't say this before, but the other ones that we looked look to, or the prior couple of slides, there was a delay in upgrade. If, if someone updated that alley database, this database over here, right? In fact, let's go back here. If I put that right there, I don't know if you caught that. Whenever this guy updated this database, it took about 48 hours to actually update it. So it wasn't like real time. So if he put another subnet over here and put a bunch of phones over here and added to a spreadsheet and then go went and put it over here, it's not real time. It's going to take a while for this alley database and for all this craziness over here to work. All right. Now, this use case, we need some faster updates. Not only that, but we need a little more sophistication in our 911 system because we need to adhere to Ray Bonds Act and Kerry's Law. All right, we need alerting. Uh, we have some nomadic users. Maybe this guy, this company now has internet users that are out here. They need to be accounted for as well. So how does all this work? First customer is going to get his same spreadsheet, right? Same kind of thing. Going to work with a network guy. Hopefully the network guy gets everything squared away, nice and tidy as far as subnetting and things like that. He's going to configure his CER, right? In this case, we're using, we'll say we're using Cisco Emerge Responder. And inside CER, he's going to put this information in there. Remember before he was putting it in over here in a dynamic alley database of the ERS in Trotto Red Sky. All right. Um, he's going to configure this CER to auto connect or to auto update via tele, uh, TLS, all right? And what's gonna happen over here is it's gonna program the dynamic alley database automatically. So as he adds, maybe he adds another subnet up here, he can add it to a CER system, and near real time, it's gonna go and update this dynamic alley database. As opposed to before, the slide before, where it wasn't automatically updated. He had to manually update it, he or her, had to manually update it and it took for up to 48 hours. Now it's kind of real time or near real time. Okay, so we've got everything configured right. Obviously when he puts in addresses over here, it's gonna update over here and it's gonna verify addresses against the MSAG over here in the ERS. All right, so he can't put in 123 Main Street, Nowhere, Texas. It will try and do this and it's gonna come back and say, nope, you can't enter that into, that's not a valid address. Oh. Okay, Jack is dialing 911 again. He is on subnet 182.168.1.0 cuz he's got 1.10 there. And we got here, there's his Elan. All right, I'm going to go through a little faster on this side, but we'll slow down over here. The call is actually going to go to Cisco Emergency Call uh, Emergency Responder here, and Emergency Responder is going to change the call ID based on this Elan. All right? There goes the call to the SBC. The SBC is going to route it not to the SIP provider, but to the ERS. It's going to get to their SBC over there. It's going to ask the VPC. We're going to go to the dynamic alley database. We're going to look up that record right there. We have that record. And guess what? We're going to do the same thing. We're going to add a field, let's say, at the SQ key. We're going to throw the SQ key in there. We're going to go back to the VPC. The Ask the selective router database, where do I need to route this call? What selective router in what region uh, so I can connect to the right PSAP? That's going to go through the selective router. It's going to get to the PSAP CPE equipment here. Along with that key, same thing here. It's going to go to the telecommunicator. It's going to, uh, the CAD system is going to ask the regional alley database. The regional alley database knows nothing of this number, doesn't have this address but he knows where to go fetch it over a data connection. There it goes to the VPC. VPC is gonna ask the dynamic alley database. It's gonna have that key. He's gonna match that key and correlate it with this address and this ELIN. There it goes, gonna go back to the regional alley database. It's gonna tell the CAD system. The CAD system is gonna pop up that on the telecommuters, uh, telecommunicators screen. All right, and you guys, I'll do good the callback because it's a little bit different here. Actually, it's the same. So if we do a callback here, it's going to go across the uh, PSDN somehow, you know, from the PSAP to the PSDN. 
get to the SIP provider, go this way. And then actually the call manager is going to send it to uh, CER. CER is going to know, hey, Jack called. You know, I know this. someone's trying to ring in this number, but it was actually Jack. Let me change that and send it back to call manager and ring Jack. Okay, just a couple of additions here because what you've seen so far kind of is what we saw uh, in the prior slide. Remember with CER things, we're going to be able to extend the feature set. So remember Carrie's Law and Ray Bonds Act, specifically Carrie's Law, where we can alert on a security desk or something like that. So this system is actually going to kind of made for that. They're going to be able to send an alert. They can conference people in when the call goes out. So there's other people, a security desk is on the phone, things like that. And then they also have, you know, people out here need, uh, uh, on the internet, maybe Jack roams to the internet and he logs in and the clients themselves, specifically a Cisco client, a Jabber client, it will come, up, it will come up and ask, hey, you know, you've changed IP addresses, give me an address. When you're putting in that address, what, what's actually happening is we're, there's a connection to CER and we're updating this address right here. So we're updating a, an address and it's ex extending or attaching an ELIN to it. All right, so that's how we're able to account for nomadic users. Remember, Carey's Law, Raybonds Act, I forget which one, but they're gonna, I think uh, January 2022 or something, you're gonna have to provide uh, for that. So that's up and coming regulation that everyone's gonna have to adhere to. All right, emergency calling with Pitaflow. We're talking about some new technology, finally. Uh, with ERS and using Microsoft Teams calling plan or direct routing. So these are almost the same if you're using calling plan or direct routing. Now I'm going to kind of explain what the differences are as we go through this. So what's the first thing we got to do? Well, we got to understand that Microsoft Teams supports what we call location information services, lists. All right. So they have like uh, for you Cisco guys, they have like a CER kind of built into Microsoft Teams, all right? This existed in Skype for Business also. Skype for Business did list services as well, but not as sophisticated as Microsoft Teams does. So Microsoft Teams does a lot more. I have a video on that, Microsoft Teams and 911. Look on my channel, you'll find it. I explain all about that. Okay, so what is the customer going to do? Well, let's, what, what's our use case first, I'm sorry. Customer wants to use MS Teams with calling plan or direct routing and needs to adhere to the new federal and state laws, All right? He needs support for real-time movement of users, needs to support alerting, remember the carries law, all right? So what does he need to order? He needs to order SIP trunking service or he needs to buy Microsoft calling plan. No more ELINs, so he doesn't have to order any ELINs. That's great, he's gonna save some money on that. Um, so let's see what he's going to do. The first thing he's going to do is got his little spreadsheet again. So he comes up with a emergency plan. Again, very similar to his ELIN ERL strategy, but now he's just going to create a civic address. He's going to create a place and he's attaching a subnet. By the way, CER and also Microsoft Teams, as well as the Intrado uh, Enterprise Gateway, Red Skies 911 manager, they all support uh, switch and port wireless access points, wireless controllers as far as doing your emergency uh, response strategy. So I'm just choosing subnets. Most people do it by subnet because it's just easier and then you don't have to rely on the type of switches you have. Back to here, let's see. Uh, just so you know, Microsoft Teams has its own list server. An MSAG. So for you Cisco guys, it has its own CER, let's say. It's got its own MSAG. All right. So the remember CER had to reach out here and kind of use this MSAG. Microsoft has its own MSAG. So they're able to validate addresses just while you're configuring your list services. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is, let's see, he's going to configure that. I think we went through that. Okay. Once you configure all your list services, as soon as a Microsoft Teams client or Microsoft Teams phone is registered, it's going to do what they call a held request, an HTTP emergency location request uh, or discovery, HTTP emergency location discovery. 
There it is. Uh, and that request is going to go to Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is going to go into its list database, look up the location of this phone. Well, in along with the request, obviously it's sending its IP address. Its IP address is 1.10. It's going to look in the list database, which is right over here. It's going to say, hey, your location, let me give you some information. Your location is 123 Elm Street, Magnolia, Texas, floor one. So that's how that works. So now it's very different. Now the phone actually has some information. It has he has his location, all right? Now, if something moves, the phone moves or something, this held request is going to uh, be uh, sent again, and the list server will then update the phone based on his location. Again, right now, we're doing subnet because it's just easier to understand um, as far as IP address changing and then looking up in the list database and telling that phone where his civic address is and where his place is or what Microsoft calls the emergency location of that particular client or phone. Okay, so now the phone knows where he's at. He's got this information with him. Here he goes. He's going to dial 911 again. That's going to go over to Microsoft Teams. That's going to go over to one of two places. And let me stop here. We're going to talk about what Microsoft Teams calling plan does as opposed to Microsoft uh, direct routing with a SIP provider like Verizon. All right, so with calling plan, what you're going to do when you configure your list service, you don't have to configure anything else. You get a kind of an ERS for free in the background. Okay, this ERS, uh, what I understand is bandwidth.com. All right, so the ERS kind of is included and you're going to be able to route your 911 calls to an ERS. You don't have a contract with ERS. You didn't go have to go out to an Entrado or Red Sky. Now, of course, this is only if you're using Microsoft Calling Plan. However, if you choose to do direct routing and use a SIP provider, then you're going to have to obviously have an SBC, right? You're going to connect up to the SIP provider, and then you're going to have to also have an ERS provider, Entrado, Red Sky, Bandwidth.com, somebody like that, all right? So that's the difference. Back to our call. Here comes the call into the SBC. It's got PitaFlow information, right? That came right from the phone. So in and along with the SIP invite, there's PitaFlow. Then the SBC is just going to forward that information. Here comes the call again into the ERS. It didn't go to the SIP provider, right? It went to the ERS provider in the case of direct routing. If we had calling plan, we don't know kind of where it goes. In fact, we don't even mess with that SBC, right? We just do calling plan inside Microsoft Teams and it go. we know it goes to an SBC somewhere, but we don't see any of this. If we do direct routing, then we see this and we're going to have to provision our SBC to make sure and route 91 calls over to the ERS that we contract with. Here's the ERS. It's going to get there with the PitaFlow information that's going to go to the VPC. The VPC is going to ask, well, not going to ask, it's going to tell the Dynamic Alley database, hey, on the fly, go ahead and create a database entry. Did you see that? You do that again. Here it comes. We're going to grab the PitaFlow information and we're going to create a record in there. And you see the DID is in there, not an ELIN or anything like that. It's to correct the DID. We have the correct address that came along with PitaFlow that came from lists. We have the place, so we have an extended uh, feature set as far as location. So we have the what Microsoft calls emergency location information. And then again, we have this key again. All right. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could send this PitaFlow information since the phone knows where he's at and we configured all this list information over here and we know where our subnets are and on and on. Wouldn't it be nice if this PitaFlow information would make all its make its way to the PSAP? Well, remember, we're designing for the lowest common denominator, and these might be analog trunks, and they can only send, remember it, a 10-digit number, an any number. All right, that's why we got this key. So now we've automatically or automatically uh, created this record here. 
Now we're going to ask the uh, selective router database, where do I need to route this call based on my DID that I have here? I got to go to this selective router. There it goes. In along with that goes the key. And this is all the same stuff here. Boom. CAD's going to ask the regional database. Here comes it back. Here comes back. And remember, depending on that key here, he knows what. Remember, these guys are connected to Entrado Red Sky Bandwidth.com. So he's got to know based on that key exactly what connection to go to. So it goes this way. Let's say this is Entrado. Goes to the VPC. Asked a dynamic alley database. And did you see that? Boom. He knows where that's at. Here's the record. Here's the reference. So here's the information that he needs to send, this DID and this address. It's going to go back to the regional database, CAD system, pop up on the screen, and there you have it. And now we have the right Annie, right? None of this translation when we get back over here, you know, when we call back this way, it's actually going to ring Jack. Okay, let's take a look at emergency calling with Pitaflow using an ERS with WebEx calling. Now this is both for WebEx calling and if you want to uh, use calling with a, a, a SIP provider, okay? There are some subtle differences here. I can point them out for you. All right, so the use case here is we're using Microsoft WebEx calling plan or SIP provider trunks, but we need to adhere to new federal and state laws. All right, we need to support real-time movement of users. It needs to support alerting right we gotta do that carries law stuff and the customer needs an ERS right so no longer need kind of the pros to this we no longer need ELINs although we will need some extra numbers I'll point that out in a little bit all right so let's take a look what do we got we got the customer over here and what does he need to do he's gonna have his little spreadsheet here and now what he's going to do is he's going to turn on the Red Sky Horizon inside WebEx Control Hub. So inside WebEx Control Hub, you can actually turn on 911 services. Now in 911 services, he's going to be able to put in what they call a held request URL. The HTTP Emergency Location Discovery URL. You'll figure out why in just a second. The customer needs to input his information inside the ERS. Okay, we're, we're saying we're using WebEx calling plan uh, or the Cisco calling plan and we're going to use Red Sky for all this. So what are we going to do? We're going to configure our WebEx control hub, right, with this stuff that I just told you about. Turning on Red Sky Horizon, putting in the HTTP uh, emergency location discovery request URL, which we're going to get from Red Sky. And then we're going to need to also log into the red sky horizon portal and we're going to need to populate this information right here so what are we doing the information is going into what we call a list server over here so red sky is providing the list server i know you can't see that very well but it's lis right there so the list server in webex is different than the list server in microsoft teams remember microsoft teams had its own list server within microsoft teams now this one's out here all right now it may not be Microsoft Teams list server it might be actually part of bandwidth but they got it tightly integrated I'm not sure on that but I would suspect that Red Sky list services here eventually will very tightly be integrated in the WebEx control hub and you will no longer need to go to the Red Sky portal to input your list information all right that's just a a future prediction all right and we have the MSAG out here that's going to check against when the customer or the partner is putting in his list information all right next when a phone comes up it's going to get some of this information so for you Cisco guys if you remember when you created a phone in call manager or communication manager everything you did device pool calling search space all that stuff kind of wrapped up in a little TFTP file, right? And that file was TFTP over to the phone when it registered and it kind of got some configuration information. Same thing is going on here. When this phone registers to WebEx, it's gonna get that 
held request URL. So it's going to have this URL, and basically when it registers, it's going to say, oh, I, I do 911 stuff, and I need to figure out where I'm at, and I have this URL that I need to connect to. So obviously there's some certificates going on here. This is an encryption connection that's going out to the Internet, right, through the Internet over to the ERS. It's going to ask this specific list server that's taking care of this particular customer where his uh, location is. What's next? It's going to give him his location. In along with this request came where he was at, the subnet, right? There we have the subnet 1.0. So the list server gave him, hey, you're at 123 Elm Street, Magnolia, Texas, floor one. So he's got that information now. The phone now, just like in the Microsoft te uh, Teams case, has the information, has his location information. Okay, here we go. We're going to call 911 again. That's going to go over the WebEx, and that's going to be extended out to an SBC somewhere, or if you're using WebEx uh, Cisco calling plan, it's an SBC, you know, uh, behind the curtains, let's say. It's going to get to that WebEx. It's going to get to that SBC. That's going to be extended not out to your SIP provider. If you have a SIP provider, it's going to be extended out to the ERS provider. It's going to get to their SBC. And here we go, kind of the same stuff we saw a little while ago. Dynamic Alley is going to be, uh, database is going to be updated. And a on-the-fly record is going to be updated right there. There's the DID because we got that from Pitaflow. We got that from Pitaflow. We got that from Pitaflow. And we're using our key, this particular ERS key, 10-digit number. We ask the selective router database, where do we need to route this thing based on our DID? That's going to give us a selective router and piece out to go out to. We're going to send that call with a call ID equal to the SQ key. That's going to get to the CPE equipment, get to the call agent. They're going to answer it. CAD is going to ask the regional database. Based on this alley I got, got which is 123211 right, the key, I need an address. To pop up on the screen, the regional database is going to say, I don't know about that, but I know where to get it. There it goes out to the right ERS, and that ERS is VPC. And you see what happened there. Boom, we're going to get that address right there and this number, because that key is was that key is a record locator for this particular record here that was dynamically created when the call came in. There we go, back to the regional database, back to the CAD, and there we are and we have our information there. I don't think I missed anything here. Let me tell you the cons. So it is, what's the date today? It's 2-10-2021. The things that work with this architecture here, this phone is, has to be an MPP phone. All right, so that's the only thing that works with this. Now you might say that's a bummer. Have no fear. Obviously, Red Sky is working with Cisco and the Teams client, excuse me, the WebEx client now is going to support this very shortly. All right. So in along with this system, if you need to provide uh, connectivity or nomadic users or alerting and things like that, Red Sky does all that. It does all that over here. So you can still support alerting. You still can uh, provide nomadic users and things like that uh, because they can choose to use the My911 app. And you can also, on-prem users that are using WebEx, use the My911 also app, but it's something extra. So just be, a, be aware of that. There's something extra you got to put on your PCs or Macs for this system to work. The only thing that works natively right now are MPP phones, but very shortly, again, the WebEx app is going to uh, be integrated and I know Red Sky I know them personally over there and they are working to uh, make this uh, native to any phone and any client uh, that WebEx supports okay that's all I have to say about that let's talk about emergency calling with Pitaflow using ERS in a mobile carrier so what's that all about and how do things work here this is exciting stuff let's check it out so we have over here in iPhone, we have an Android, we have this iPhone connected um, to one of these towers here, and they're registered um, to a mobile carrier. That 
phone is registered to a mobile carrier. Okay, over here we have the mobile carrier. We have an ERS also over here. Now I separated these two because sometimes these are hosted at another location. All right, so we can pretty much say this is an ERS. All right, we can just say that. And then we have a PSAP out here. Obviously, we're going to be connected up to uh, 5,000 plus of these from the mobile carrier. So let's see what happens. We're going to dial 911. Here it comes in. The first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to get a location request from the carrier's list server over to the tower. All right, this tower is at address 123 Elm Street. All right, the first thing that's going to come is or back to the list server to update the database is the address of the tower right we don't know where this guy is yet but we know where the tower is because he's registered to this tower this is where he, he the, the call came in from he's um, his signaling path is through this through this tower lists is going to update the national dynamic alley database with the call id the address that was provided from the tower this address which is the address of the tower and then we have an ESRK, not an ESRQ. So that's a little bit different. Different name, uh, nomenclature, same exact thing. So this is the emergency service routing key, very similar to the emergency service query key that we were talking about before. But, and it's a 10 digit number, nonetheless. And there's uh, obviously 10, it wouldn't be the same number. This is TCS out here. Uh, providing ERS services so they would have their own bank of numbers as well all right I just have the same number on every slide all right so what happens next we're going to go the VPC right the VPC is going to ask the SRDB um, we're going to go ahead and route that call over to the right PSAP based on the selective router that we got back from the selective router database based on the DID. All right, then we're going to go to the PSAP uh, agent or the telecommunicator. CAD's going to ask the, the regional database. There comes the key back to the VPC. It's going to ask the National Alley database, right? We have an entry. We're going to correlate this number, that key, over to address, right? So now we have back to the CAD. Now we have an address. Okay, you see this flag right here. So this is flagged as wireless. So we get some information. We know, uh, or the PSAP knows, when it's a wireless call. When we know it's a wireless call, there's some different technology that's going on here calling uh, in the CAD system uh, or in the CPE equipment over here. Could be the CAD system as well, but we're going to ask for a rebid so what rebid is you'll hear that term when their mobile carriers are talking about 911 and rebid is to update the location in the background let's get back to this in the background you can see over here you see what happened next we got a rebid from the list server so the list server is now asking the tower i need some more information here i need i need to to guesstimate the location a little bit better than just your address so what happened in the background is some algorithms that kicked off and this tower is kind of narrowing down where this phone is so you can see there's sectors here you see how the towers are usually constructed in like a triangle so what it's doing is oh i know this guy came in from this bank of uh antennas over here so he's in this sector what they call a sector and then let's do some rf magic which i wouldn't pretend to know but there's some RF magic ping this guy and things like that that are going to get a little bit better location information about where this phone exactly is. So what happens? We're going to get this rebid coming back now from the systems over here. Here comes the rebid. You can see that my at the same time my rebid was coming back. Uh, it got back to the list server and got back to the National Dynamic Alley database and you see that it updated all right let me go back okay so this rebid coming back this guy is going to update this guy because he's got better information as far as location right now you can see boom there it goes okay so now when this request comes in this rebid 
the VPC is going to ask the National Dynamic Alley database, hey, give me that information again. I need to update the address because I know you're wireless and wireless work a little bit different and they're moving around and they may have changed addresses or we may have narrowed it down a little bit better. And so now we have a better address and now this address is going to be provided. We won't go all the way back through this, but it's going to go all the way back, you know, and get updated on the screen. And now we got a little bit better information or honing in a little bit further as far as the address of this phone. So that's how things work. Uh, obviously, there's technologies we'll I'll talk about now. And if you see the EED here and ELS, these are technologies in both uh, ELS being in Android phones. That's the uh, emergency location services that Android supports. And in Apple phones, we use the enhanced emergency data. So these are, remember your mobile phones have GPSs, accelerometers, barometers, so they can really calculate your use Google, Google Maps or Apple Maps or, you know, those kind of things. And you can see, man, it's, it's, it's pretty accurate. It knows where you're at. So the GPS is in there. Not many folks, not many mobile carriers are using those yet. As I understand, there's one mobile carrier uh, that's uh, kind of playing around with it right now. But this is technology that's now there in the phones. It's been in the phones for a long time, but to, to get that information and to have common protocols, you know, and have this ELS and EED and have that all figured out, how the carrier itself is going to grab that information and then do some PitaFlow stuff, right, and update the list server and then eventually get all the way out to the telecommunicator, the PSAPs. And usually we got to go, we got to do this ESRK key and all this other stuff. So anyway, yeah, so that's how that's working. You can see the future is definitely going to be using EED, ELS. There's actually another one outside. This is just in the States, outside the States, uh, AML or something like that. So you can Google that. So they use a little bit different protocols, a little different technology for phones outside the U.S. What else do we want to talk about here? I'm going to shift gears real quick because you will find a lot of newer technologies out there. And what's happening is there's other companies out there. Let me go bring this in. There's other companies out there like Rapid OS that are saying, hey, the mobile carriers are lagging behind as far as 911. And we've got a system that can talk to ELS, it can talk to EED, and we can get exact information on where that iPhone is if they call 911 or where that Android is when they call 911. Let me go through this real quick and then I'm going to talk about this ADR right here. So what happens here, let's say this call came in and this PSAP, that we have this information up on the screen, and this PSAP subscribes to this service. They contracted Rapid SOS and they said, you know what? We're not getting accurate information from these mobile carriers. These guys came in Rapid SOS and they're going to give us a little bit more and we're going to contract with them. When this 911 call comes in, they have the Annie number. So what they're going to do out here is ask the Rapid SOS list server. That list server is going to go out and fetch that information from ELS or EED from the phones, from the smartphones. And this is what's going to come back, the PitaFlow information. So you can see we're doing PitaFlow now. And we do a, the, the same thing over here, held request. So that technology is used here as well. So this is kind of, they call it over the top stuff. So you have to subscribe to it. The PSAP has to subscribe to it. And in some instances, the actual phones need to subscribe to it, like have an app and things like that. Not always. Anyway, yeah, you want to learn more about that. Rapid SOS is kind of the, the place to go. Now, if you guys, a lot of PSAPs are doing this where they, they're subscribing to services like Rapid SOS, and they have some additional information. So they'll say, like, I think there's a smart 911 is one of them. You can call your local sheriff's department uh, or go to your local county and say, do we subscribe to Rapid SOS or, or smart 911? And what that is, is you'll be able to log in with your PC or your smartphone and create an account. And when you create an account, you're actually creating an account in this service over here. And what you'll do is we'll start updating additional data resources in 
this database. So what do I mean by that? Well, I can put my kids' names. I can put my floor plan to my house. I can, in, along with my floor plan, I can say, hey, you know, uh, Alex is this room and Trinity's in that room and Remy's in this room and Caden's in this room and mom and dad are in this room and this is our kitchen. And I can also put information like I have a heart condition or I'm a, allergic to penicillin or things like that. So when I do call 911 and if, my PSAP is subscribing to this service, they'll get more information on this screen, like my floor plan. Maybe I'm calling for fire and they'll get a lot more information, information that I voluntarily gave them through the app or through the website. And so, yeah, that's why they're getting a little bit smarter. And again, they're kind of leapfrogging the mobile carriers, right? And they're saying, those guys are way behind. We're doing something really cool over here, partner with us and we'll grab this information even give you some additional information if you get your county residents on this kind of stuff and get them to log in and give us some more information we'll be able to serve our community better okay let me wrap all this up in a tidy little bow here and what i want to do here is give you what a psap telecommunicator desktop looks like so this is one right here and Look at this guy. He's got eight screens here. So I just want to kind of give a shout out to these guys and give them some attaboys because come to find out that these just aren't call agents out there in the PSAP. These are highly skilled, highly trained people that know a lot about EMS. They know a lot about dispatching. They know a lot about coordinating and, and they have a very highly stressful job. Just think of you're working a 12 hour shift and all of that 12 hour shift, you're taking calls, moms on the phone with their kids heads split open or wives on the phone, their husbands just fell over and is having a stroke they think and they're talking to these people. It's a highly stressed environment. They gotta calm the person down and they gotta provide EMS support until someone gets there. People are highly stressed. A lot of times they don't know where they're at. Maybe they're upside down in a car and you're dialing 911, maybe it's a small child that's six, seven years old and calling mommy fell down the stairs and they don't know where that child is at. The child doesn't know where they're at. So they're having to coordinate a lot of things and that's why they have all these screens. Let's just go through them real quick. Screen one, airport alerting. So they're gonna have a screen that uh, comes in and, and these are for local airports. Maybe there's a plane coming in with no landing gear or something, so they have to dispatch to that. So they're gonna have a direct connection to the airport just in case the airport needs fire EMS police. Screen two, this is where your phone system is gonna be. This is where 911 calls are gonna come in. Text 911, admin lines for people that are calling in the PSAP uh, on the admin lines, fire alarms, medical alarms, crew lines. This is where they're gonna call crew to crew. You know, they could be in different buildings. They could be in different floors. You're going to have your fast dials, like electric, gas company, water company. When those calls come in, you know, I smell gas at the 123 Elm Street and things like that. So they're going to have these fast dials right on there. Screen three, this is going to be your alley any mapping. Now, let me pause here. Every telecommunicator sets their desktops and their screens up differently. So it's up to them. I'm just giving you one perspective here. All right, back to screen three. Alley Annie mapping for 911. This is when your 911 calls are going to come in. Your address is going to come in and it's going to place that call on a map. Not Google Maps. These are purpose built maps. Screen four, your CAD mapping. This is going to correlate with your Annie screen for 911 calls. It's also going to show your 911 calls, but it's going to also show all the 911 calls in the district. It's going to also show officer locations, EMS locations, what officers are on call. So in one map, these dispatchers can see visually very quickly, oh, someone called from 123 Elm Street. Officer Garcia is on the next block. I know when I start the dispatch uh, process, he's going to be my dispatch. I'm going to call him. He's not on a call. I can see that visually. So they have all this information in front of them. We have screen five over here on the right. It's got CAD pictometry map for view. Now, these this is not your Google Earth stuff. These are high-res satellite pictures that hone in on particular areas. If you want to get a 
a police officer to the north side of the building, go right past that staircase and go past that door. I mean, they're very high resolution pictures so the dispatcher can actually talk the officer or EMS to particular locations and they almost see as good as the officers. In fact, a lot of times better because they have an aerial view or a 3D view. Uh, yeah, people like uh, Eagle View, if you want to Google that. These are the guys that are making this kind of mapping software. Screen 6, active calls. All the active calls that are going on right now, local to local, you know, or excuse me, law to law calls. So if they need to call a state agency, uh, BLM, uh, Fish and Game, this is where they're going to be able to do that. The interview questions for a call. So if a medical call comes in, my husband's left arm is tingling. Okay, boom, they're going to put that in. The screen's going to come up. They're going to be able to go through a script and, and, and make sure, okay, get him on the floor. Is he breathing okay? Ask him to. They're going to take him through this script and make sure that they're doing everything possible to keep that person alive uh, before the EMS uh, show up and take over. Okay, any standby medical and, and officers that are on standby. So we'll give a textual screen of all the people that are on call, all the county deputies, the police that are on call. So very quickly, if they need to get, they need to rally the SWAT team or rally a, a bunch of officers or EMS to a particular location, they're going to know in one screen and be able to contact all those people. All right. And then screen eight, we got internet, Google, email, you know, your calendar and things like that. Now, this is a lot of info. There's a lot of systems going on here. This stuff is obviously very complicated, a lot of interfacing. As I understand, a lot of the APIs are kind of lacking in this area. So we're looking to improve this. I know Nina's looking to improve this. And this is getting better by the day. Um, PSAP as a service is kind of a thing. But as I understand, it hasn't really taken hold yet. So PSAP as a thing is out there. And then services plugging into the PSAP to, to provide all these technology and all these services. That is what I think... EziNet is going to finally turn into, and there'll be a lot of private companies that sell into EziNet, uh, like Eagle View and you know Rapid SOS and things like that, to provide services into that EziNet cloud, and then all the PSAPs can kind of subscribe to that, to these services that provide all this. But right now, a lot of these things are disparate from PSAP to PSAP. Uh, as far as what applications they're using. So that is it. I hope this has been helpful and thank you for watching.